Hello, everyone. This is Mary Curie with Frontrunners Innovate, also the uh, president and CEO of Frontrunners Development, uh, which is an organization that connects people as impact partners. And so what we love more than anything else is innovation and innovative thinking and processes that get our attention that um, moves everything from you know economic development and education to finance forward. And so we are talking to one of those finance forward <laughs> innovators today. His name is Chris Connett. And Chris, welcome. We appreciate you being with us. And oh, what a uh, joy it is to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're kind of our crypto genius. <laughs> we are you and you and Ryan. So I will say this um, from the standpoint of global business development, I think that you're you're really starting to get around in places with um, with ideas of how to do things that I think are very intriguing and they're really opportunities for people. And if people are inclined to um, maybe have some knowledge of finance in, you know, the space of cri uh, crypto and maybe um, data, that that sort of thing, um, there's an intersection there where there's an opportunity. And I think that before I get myself into trouble, because I don't know enough, I'm going to turn it over to you. But what I'd like to do is have you share a little bit about your background and then bring us up to where you decided to to get into the chipset farms and tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Well, again, thank you for having me on your program. And, uh, you know, my my background is heavily in uh, really creative ad agency marketing. Then I got into web apps, uh, you know, any kind of apps, really. Uh, a lot of social PR. Uh, that was my work for about 20 to 25 years where I was uh, owner and founder and CEO of my own company and grew it. Um, had different versions of it, sold one, sold another one, sold a third. <laughs> My last uh, exit there was probably around 2015. And one of the takeaways I had during that entire time was just the only thing constant seemed to be the change, you know, that was going on in technology and just all the, you'd go to set a, a system or a process in place only to have it two years later, it was already gone and we had to go on and move on to something else. Um, but that that was a, a really wonderful time. I do have to say that 600 branding projects later, I was kind of burned out and ready to move on, um, but really made a name for myself in the industry. Um, met a lot of CEOs, also a lot of business owners along the way, um, met some big name clients, and that has that was a really wonderful, fruitful time. Uh, after that, I started moving more into investing um, on my own, generally with uh, a lot of real estate. I I moved into some private equity. I did stocks and options. I, um, I and when I did even some of the private equity deals, I would tell my friends about it, and they would say, "Hey, you know, how can I get in on that?" And so I learned how to build funds so that I could put my money and then my friends' money in it and do it right and legally and compliantly. And I did at that time what I call my hundred thousand dollar lawyer education, which means I basically paid my attorney to tell me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> And um, that was that was actually very helpful in learning how to structure companies properly and what's involved. And so all that education just kind of grew uh, into moving into uh, crypto, which was around 2019. I got involved. Um, COVID hit. That was a good time to really study up more on crypto. Uh, it was a good time. And so since that time uh, to date, I've I've probably raised, including my own money, about Close to close to 50 million in capital, I think, mm -hmm. um, it, for a lot of different projects and and companies and et cetera. So um, one of the things that I've been a little bit frustrated about in the private equity space, um, I like joining with the CEO. I like partnering with them. I like to mentor them. I like to see them flourish. I like to see them create cultures that uh, actually honor God is one of my things that I really enjoy. But one of the challenges that I also have is that um, when I make investments there, my capital gets locked up, um, it, meaning I, I can't do anything. And some of those uh, private equity deals are are very, they've been pretty long term. <laughs> I'm talking like, I'm talking seven years. Okay. You're getting old uh, while it's happening, while they're finally getting to ROI. Gosh, okay. have not seen a return yet on a number of them. Now, I kind of expect that, right? I mean, they say you invest in 10, only one's going to actually hit. It it's kind of does that. Um, but it's also what they don't say is all the work that I'm still doing on the eight or nine that aren't doing anything, right? So they're kind of either flat. I've actually had a couple commit fraud, which wasn't good. 
Um, and so I've just been really trying to walk through that with the CEO who I'm also very angry at at the same time. So I have to deal with my emotions on trying to walk through, through with him on that. But also, you know, the fact that I was, I got burned in the process wasn't, wasn't fair. Um, but all that to say is that, you know, the experience of being an investor has been very fruitful and worthwhile. And, um, that probably leads me to your question, which is ultimately one is my, what is one of my most favorite projects today and why? <laughs> so I think I'll answer that in this way is, um, given what my experience in the private equity realm, I, um, and not seeing those returns and just some things, I decided to kind of jump back into uh, business ownership again. Mm -hmm. And I fell into an opportunity last year that was very exciting because I liked it for the reasons that it was returning results pretty quickly, like within about three or four months as opposed to seven years, right? Yeah. Uh, and what we do is we effectively um, buy or you would buy chipset units, mm -hmm. okay? And from us, and then you would rent them back to a data center. So the need right now is massive. Um, data centers are going crazy with AI, um, yeah. game rendering, mm -hmm. uh, block, blockchain, node kinds of things, just big data processing. Okay, all anything that involves heavy duty data rendering, etc. The um, there are also two kind of types of data centers, I guess I would say there's kind of this web two model, which is like you think of web hosting or Amazon mm -hmm. AWS services or all these things where, you know, we're used to like we think of the cloud and it's kind of out there that's generally like web two. Web three will say, okay, we want to do that stuff, but we want to take it to the next level and integrate crypto into it, possibly, mm -hmm. or maybe um, maybe some kind of reward system or NFTs or something like that. Yeah. All this new stuff that's coming out. How do we how do we mix it together? Um, that's the new style of data center, and those kinds of data centers require much more powerful um, chipset units. They're generally called uh, GPU graphical processing units. They're big, fast, super hungry uh, chipsets that basically require a good amount of uh, power to process out the data that they need. So here's a real world, here's a real world example in gaming is right now, I think that if you go to pretty much any online game, the maximum amount of online players might be about 100. Um, yeah. And that would be because as you're playing a battle scene, it mm -hmm. needs to render the you know, the whole experience for yeah. the user in real time while they're actually playing for 100 people, which is pretty mm -hmm. intense. With the new Web3 data center model, using our chipset units, which are like these GPUs that I was talking about, these graphical yeah. processing units, imagine playing that same game now, not with 100, but with half a million people. Yeah. You have the whole battle, scene, you know, the massive battle scene, right, coming together. That is an example of the level of processing that's needed for that. And as you could potentially imagine, just with AI and just all the intense processing and thought that needs to go into um, delivering results that can actually kind of think for you, machine learning kinds of things. So anyways, these data centers are, are starting to pop up and um, they are very, very necessary to the direction that our um, data science is going. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to this data center last year and I said, tell me, tell me about what, you know, what are your pain points? You know, what, what's going on with you guys? And these were, these were um, connections that I had. And, and they said, well, Chris, um, one of the challenges that we have is when we, when we take on a client, a big client, so say it was like Toyota and they wanted to know how can we integrate, you know, car sales with crypto yeah. somehow. And this would be a data center that could help figure that out. These clients would come to them and they would do a deal with the data center. And now the data center would have to go out and buy chipset units to, yeah. to process all this stuff. So it was a cost center to them. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, hear me out just for a second. If you were to still go out and buy those chipset units, but instead of implement them, wholesale them to my company and I'll resell them to the marketplace. OK, mm -hmm. so you can mark them up as you sell them to me and I'll resell them to the marketplace and then let the marketplace rent them back to you. Mm -hmm. In a revenue share, we call it rent, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's like basically they'll share the, the, the processing. 
they love the idea. Why? Because say a, a chipset unit was like nine grand or something, you know, that they were spending nine grand per chipset unit. And, um, and we in turn would say, how about mark that up, you mm -hmm. know, put, put extra cost on that, go ahead and mark it up. And now I've turned it from a cost center for them now into a profit center. Mm -hmm. So instead of spending their capital right away as a capital expense, they're now making this money immediately, right? Upon taking on the client, they wholesale them out right away. They make money. Then of course, later when the chipset units are running 24, seven, 365, they're processing this data. And I know that the data center also takes a cut you know, from that as well, like what's going on. And then the rest of it, they send to me and I, I push it on to the, uh, to the chipset unit owners in the form of that's their net rent every month. Mm -hmm. So to, for the marketplace to actually buy the chipset units, they would need to, um, basically go, you know, just kind of watch our videos, get a quick explanation of it. They mm -hmm. sell for around 12,000 if you're just buying one mm -hmm. and they rent out for about five to 600 a month as net rent. And that's wow. after all the, uh, you know, administration fees have been taken out. It's about, it averages about five to 600. To be honest, our, our lowest performing month was, I think, 425. And our best performing month was 808. This is for the chipset unit owners. So yeah. that's why for vernacular, I just like to say between five yeah. to 600 a month average. Yeah. So anyways, that, that in a nutshell is what it is. We, we're super excited about it because uh, people are catching on going, wait a minute. So I can actually be part of this AI revolution without having to do something significant here. I can just basically buy a chipset unit. And the answer is yes. That's exactly what it is because the chipset units are going to last for seven years. They're insured mm -hmm. for seven years. So anybody who buys one is going to be basically making five to 600 a month for the next 84 months. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty attractive to be able to make money like that by purchasing an asset. It's like buying a, a car, I guess, and renting out your car, like on Truro or something, you know, just <laughs> to have that, to have that ability so, to take an asset and rent it out is kind of neat. Well, you just brought up something that was really funny because I always thought that, you know, when you buy a car, it starts depreciating the moment you, you get it out of the dealership. But is there anything like that with something like this? Absolutely. Other than life is seven years, right? Yeah, you're right. There is depreciation for sure. It depreciates down to zero, basically. Right. Um, at the end of the seven year contract, after it's been rented for the last 84 months, after you've made your money back, and then quite a bit, right? I'm guessing that would be what, about three and a half to four times, you know, what you put into it. Um, you just surrender the chipset units, and right. our data center will then recycle them you know, properly. And mm -hmm. that's about it. Um, we don't really have a plan for after seven years or what happens if the chipset units are still working well. Mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit about maybe doing like a month to month kind of end of life contract right. that we can add on yeah. to the end. I don't know. But as far as it goes right now, we're, our, our intention is to just recycle. Um, the data center does have chipset units there that are nine years old. So mm -hmm. we know that it's possible that they may there may be some extra life in it, but when you're, you know, when you're building a company and building a contract and getting the things insured and all this stuff, it's like, that was the number that came out. It's seven years. So it does depreciate over time. Um, yeah. But here's the other thing we have that's kind of neat. You know, some of our uh, buyers were saying, well, I'm super interested, but I wish that I could know exactly how much rent is coming in every month. You know, I'd like to know what that number is. And since we can't, nail it down mm -hmm. we said instead let's offer a performance 100 percent money back performance guarantee mm -hmm. so at the end of 24 months if you're not happy with the rent that you've received we will buy those back okay and that's something that we offer right now for yeah. anybody purchasing which is i think it really de-risks you know the whole thing to, to yeah. go well I'll give it a shot and if it doesn't work yeah. out yeah. i'll just sell them back to you you're guys still gonna you be getting money every month so let me yeah. ask you this. Is there any chance that um, innovation will come along and kick this aside and something new is replacing it in this cycle of seven years? I mean, is it possible something yeah. like that would happen? Yeah, at minimum, you would think even just faster chipset units, right? Um, okay. But 
uh, there is uh, there is a thing, you know, quantum computing, and people are looking at all these uh, high levels of ways of think of uh, of getting processing power at infinite speeds, right? So, um, if something like that did happen, it would take a long time to to implement at this point. To implement and take yeah. over. I mean, you got to yeah. look at other technologies out there. Like look at like look at landlines versus mobile. You know. Mm -hmm sort of like yes mobile did replace landlines but landlines are still being put in you know even yeah, though it's like, won't get rid of ours <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it just won't. Okay. yeah i just mean that you kind of expected it would take over but it, it would take a long time to replace mm -hmm. I, I was also invested in this technology that that um was uh had purported to do wireless power and the idea was like well wouldn't that like get rid of our grid and the answer is no it would take just so many years to implement that there's so much investment in the infrastructure and same with chipset units mm -hmm. so i don't think that it's just an overnight thing um mm -hmm. people have discussed you know when will we see something that's so drastic that it would take a while to implement i mean we're talking maybe 10 years away mm -hmm. so we think that seven is fine for now um like i yeah. said they have nine-year-old chipset units that are still working mm -hmm. so i guess if it's still working and it's still processing as long as it's not inefficient, you know, with power or something, might as well just keep it there if it's making money. So um, that's kind of the thinking behind it. And right now we're keeping an eye on it, but we don't we don't seem to be threatened very much by innovation and change, although we welcome it. Um, one of the areas though that that there is change and it's not really my on my responsibility, but it is on the data center side, which is to how to how to get more output out of the chipset units that they have. Mm -hmm. So there are there are cooling systems and things like that that are new technologies that could get implemented that might give longer life to the, the chipset units. So that's something that we watch. And as our data center, which really isn't just one, they're actually in five locations, um, as they maybe select a, a new location, they might look for some of the more, you know, current yeah. methods of cooling that weren't there five years ago. You know what I'm saying? They'll take advantage of the latest technology, whatever that is. So walk us through um, somebody who may be watching that would be interested in this. Literally, there's almost, there's very little they really have to do. <laughs> I think that that's really kind of handled on your end, the way I understand it. But walk us through that. And then on the back end, when it's time to get um, the payola, <laughs> you know, how that happens so that they know. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So generally, um, starting with, you know, general interest, we're, um, may I mention a website? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, it's rcfc.io. So the letters rcfc.io stands for Resound Chipset Farm Company. Um, if they go there, that would be a like a 12 minute video that'll give them some initial yeah. understanding. Um, after the video, um, they can go to the website and that website is um, bigdataasaservice.net, Big Data as a service.net, all one like long word. Um, and what that is, is a place where they can actually purchase. So once they go in, they're going to be, <clears throat> they're going to be asked to give some customer information right there. Also provide their ID. We're doing a, a know your client KYC on them. Um, then the first contract that they come to is the actual purchase agreement. So they're buying the chipset unit. Like I said, they sell just one sells for 12, but if you buy more, there's volume discounts, the price goes down. Um, when they're buying it, they're going to indicate how many they're buying and it'll generate a purchase order. And that purchase order is necessary to understand um, that they are in fact buying these units under this purchase num purchase order number. So that's the first contract that they sign. Once that's done, they can buy with US dollar, crypto, credit card, you know, they can buy it with different ways. And then, um, then our uh, admin team needs to confirm their purchase and they send out a second contract and that's the rental contract that's the one that allows them to now to take the chipset unit that they've purchased and rent it out so we separated those because we want to make sure that the owner actually owns the chipset unit before they try to rent it you know what I mean? <laughs> that makes sense yes so um so at the rental point um they sign that contract and and then basically the you know the orders get placed um, they get placed at the end of the month for that month so um we're currently having this interview in the middle of the month and an order will go out at the end of this month for everybody who ordered during the month. Um, then the clock starts. It takes about 60 days to 
receive the chipset units because they need to be ordered. They have to come in. They need to be unwrapped, whatever, installed, okay. mm -hmm. put software on it. Um, they need to be installed into the data center. That takes 60 days. So it's actually the third month is the first earnings month where it's actually do, doing its work. Yeah. And, and month four is the first payout month based okay. on month three, right? So, and uh, and then after that, after month four, it's it's every month thereafter is oh. you get a, you'll get a payment for the month previous. So that's walking it through the process. The owner though gets a really nice dashboard that they can monitor their serial numbers of their chipset units. They can track their, um, the uh, payments, you know, as they're coming in uh, and going out, I guess you could say to their wallets. We do pay out in crypto. We do that on purpose because we have a lot of uh, purchasers who are using crypto and they don't want to be paid out in uh, dollars. They want to be paid back in crypto. Uh, and so we set it up that way. It's a, it's the only way that we do it. We pay out in USDC. So it's not like we're paying in a fluctuating coin. We're, we're paying mm -hmm. it in a, in a, uh, a stable coin, although <laughs> recent times USDC is somewhat <laughs> debatable, but, but uh, let's just say it's, you know, it's worth a dollar and supposed to always be a dollar. So that's what we pay out in. Um, after that, I mean, users could potentially come back later. They could buy more uh, mm -hmm. if they want. There's a, there's also a tax center in the dashboard. So at the end of the year, it'll show if they have made any gains. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, that's not going to happen in the first year because it's, it's generating the income, but it's paying back, you know, the capital that they first sure. put out on it. So there's sure. generally not going to be any gains mm -hmm. initially um, until we, we reach that point, which we, we expect will be well reached well before the 24 month uh, yeah. satisfaction guarantee kicks in. Yeah. Fantastic. So back to the, the way that the rent is calculated, whatever, can you give an idea about how that works? Is it based on the performance of the chips or tell me a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah. Good question. Really good question, actually. And it helps for me to just explain just a little bit. Um, so you might recall that we make the orders at the end of the month for everybody that ordered during that month. So they all become a group. And so oh. everybody, um, so we're interviewing here in the month of May. So everybody at the end of May will be become one group. Therefore, the payment that comes out will be paid as a group. And therefore, everybody in that group will be paid the same amount. Okay. Um, and one of the other reasons for that is in case there was a, um, a maintenance issue on one of the chipset units, then an individual is not penalized specifically because their chipset unit um, yeah. needed a placement or something. It's yeah. it's basically everybody in the group. So no one really notices, I guess you could say that the that one chipset was down for a couple hours. You know, it's just it's going to be across the the whole board. The entire group is going to be paid. Now, um, on top of that, the data center is um, they have their software and controls that really try to distribute the load across every monthly group. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but we have seen just some very slight variances. For example, um, you know, if you bought a, I'll just make this up for a minute. If, if you bought a chipset unit in May and you bought another one, say in July from now, um, one, and then, and then now you're in at the end of the year, say you're in November and you're looking mm -hmm. back on those purchases, like one might produce 550 in one month and another chipset unit you bought in a different month might be like 552 or 553. So very slight variances between, but that's the job of the data center is to distribute the load of the work, the workload across all the chipset units that they have. And they, they do a pretty good job. It gets pretty close. And like I said, whatever, and then as we're paid, it comes out in the group that you're in. And then we distribute that, whatever that number is, we distribute it pro rata equally across everybody in that, in that group. Fantastic. So how long you've been doing this and how successful would you say? Because you've been, as you said, in some successful ventures and some that maybe not yeah. so much so. And I know from talking to you over the last few months, this one is has been doing pretty well, but share when it started and how well you think you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So last year, um, a group of us got together and we kind of did a pilot program before we rolled it out super publicly. Um we went to a few individuals, a few larger groups and made mention of what we're offering and we sold 600. So oh, wow. okay. it wasn't very difficult to do. This is what's interesting. So this was by December, we had sold 600. And it turned out that we still, I don't even think we made 10% of the demand 
that we had mm -hmm. for chips to units. So selling 600, you do the math, it's, you know, over 6 million in sales just in our pilot program. So then I took a break um, and I basically was tasked to go and build out um, our reseller um, website, I guess you could say, and start to basically take this to the public and let individuals buy them and those kinds of things. So that took a good three and a half months to build. And I'm going to be honest, we're still kind of, you know, we're, I guess you could say in that regard, we're like a startup, but we're kind of not because we have all these units from before that we're, we're monitoring. But there was a gap there for a little bit where we didn't sell any because we were building, 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 and now we have it done. And we've, uh, we've already been selling again. So this is our, um, this particular month is our second month under our phase two, uh, you know, selling these out and we're, things are looking great. As a matter of fact, our third month coming up here, uh, we may have a, uh, a customer who, who's spoken to us about buying all of them out. So we may not have any available to uh, sell in June, um, it, it, to individuals, but we, we should be back on it for July. We do still have some room in May here, um, before it gets too late, but anyways, that's, that's kind of where we're at. And so, so as you can tell, we need to speak with the data center on a regular basis and say, how many do you have available for us this yeah. month? Is there, yeah. Their primary role is to onboard those Web3 clients that need this kind of hosting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if they, if they, you know, that's where their focus needs to be. We are the secondary business model that's yeah. coming out of the data center, right? This is the extra special thing for the, for the marketplace. Yeah. Um, but the primary model of the data center is to serve their clients. And so as long as they have that coming in, which obviously right now it's going bananas for them because they can't, you know, they can't, they can't get on top of it fast enough. Right. So I guess if there's, um, in terms of success, there's sales success for sure, but where we have to watch it is our operational success, right? We have to make sure that we have, um, that the data center is able to support the, the, yeah. the speed of everybody coming on and that they can, they have the staff and they're ramping up properly to also service our needs too. So that, that could be a factor in it so far we're doing okay, but you know, we have to basically look at this year. This is uh, 2023. We got to look at this year as a year to um, to definitely take in and all the early adopters who want to come and join, but also still work on uh, process and building out uh, because we believe by you know the end of next year we are going to be have we will have sold so many by then, and we just want to make sure that we're serving everybody properly and well. That sounds just like you. <laughs> everything I know about you is professional and ethical and do everything the right way. Yeah. And I, I think that's what everybody gets from you, Chris. So thank you for presenting this interesting opportunity so that we can kind of get it out there. And actually, while you were speaking, two more names popped up that never did before. So that's the way that works, right? That's more great. information a few times over than you start to go, wait, 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 you know, uh, and that's the way it happens with us. So thank you again for sharing this information. And uh, we will try to get this out by the end of May. So those few units that might be left can, can maybe have a shot. That's okay. At, we'll, at, yeah, we'll uh, have room for them at some point. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And uh, for anybody that's watching this on one of our other channels, just uh, go to frontrunnersinnovate.com uh, where you'll get this interview. But also I'm going to get Chris to make sure that I have the YouTube that he mentioned about, I think the video that he mentioned about, so that we can make sure that that's dropped in and embedded as well. And uh, any other information that he wants to provide and, and contact information, because some of you may have questions if this is a little bit new for you. And so we definitely want you to be able to reach out via LinkedIn or something, maybe through the website if there's a contact point. So we'll give you all that information at frontrunnersinnovate.com. And I'll say again, thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. It's always good to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. So now that you've heard the interview, exactly what did you hear? We tell our business development students all the time that there are at least three opportunities in every introductory business conversation. You probably are hearing them, but maybe you're not processing them as opportunities for you. So here are the ones that I've heard in this interview. Our interview guest, Chris Conant, is laying out an opportunity to partner with his business, Resound Chipset Farm, as a buyer of chipsets to be rented to a data farm, a way of participating in the tech world that has extreme need for chipsets to service various industries, and he even talked about the industries. So you have an idea there. Number two, there is an opportunity here to serve as a referral agent for Chris's company. 
So if you know of people who would be interested in maybe buying these chipsets, you would benefit with a commission from making the introduction. Okay. Lastly, I'm hearing opportunities for partnerships that would make sense for Chris's business. You know, he tells us that they pay out in crypto. So a crypto company or a digital wallet company, you know, the founders and decision makers thereof could be interested in partnering with him. Family office contacts with investors who love crypto, fintech, AI, and other tech, they could be interested in an easy opportunity, not just as sort of an, an investment really, but more as an easy way to get involved and build a little more investable income. So there are your three opportunities. And if you're interested in learning more about business development or partnering with us, be sure to reach out. Until next time, just know that the world needs front runners like you. I'm glad you are one.